Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're commemorating the service to this country of Pat Tillman and looking at the work of the Pat Tillman Foundation. As a reminder to our viewers, Pat Tillman voluntarily left his NFL career with the Arizona Cardinals after 9-11 to enlist in the U.S. Army and was later killed by friendly fire in Afghanistan. It is my great pleasure to welcome our special guest, Dan Futrell, Chief Executive Officer of the Pat Tillman Foundation, which is dedicated to uniting and empowering military service members, veterans, and spouses into building our next generation of public and private sector leaders. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so honored that you're here, and I'm so looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate you sharing this platform with me, with me and us. Well, and you're coming to us from uh, Chicago, where you're where you're actually doing a presentation. Hence, the institutional background uh, yeah, that you have. Yeah. What What are you doing right now uh, in terms of uh, your speaking? Yeah, so um, I'm at uh, I'm I'm on a building here at the University of Chicago. Uh, there is a, a three day event uh, hosted by Service to School. Service to School um, is a nonprofit uh, started by actually two Tillman scholars uh, almost ten years ago. Uh, who in service to school helps typically enlisted uh, service members apply to and successfully apply to um, competitive uh, undergraduate institutions. Institutions, and so um, this morning I was on a on a I was interviewing one of our Tillman scholars, also a service to school uh, uh, recipient, and um, Ricky Holder, uh, somebody who's pretty exceptional, uh, served six years in the Navy, and um, and wants to wants to improve the foster care system in the world. Um, himself having aged out of foster care at age eighteen, and so um, you know, uh, part of my my Friday today is um, is you know uh, talking about the people that we serve uh, and sharing our mission, sharing our work uh, with a broader audience, which has been fun. A lot of, a lot of uh, military students in the room, a lot of university administrators in the room who want to serve uh, their veteran population as well. And it's so important, this, this point that you made, and this is just by coincidence, right? You talk about one of your scholars having grown up through the foster care system and now wanting to take his skills and use those skills to, to better the foster care system, this intersectionality is so important. It is absolutely the case that many, many service people come from all these different experiences, and then they acquire skills and would like to uh, bring back. And then during their military service, they have additional uh, um, uh, challenges that they've overcome. They might have been injured, uh, they might be disabled in some way. They might have experienced some forms of trauma that as they navigate themselves, they can bring their own experiences to inform the work of organizations that they serve, whether they're businesses, government, or nonprofit organizations. There's an incredible font of knowledge, but we need to create the path to transition from that military uh, career path into a civilian career path. How do you take a look at, at taking the, the story of Pat Tillman and embedding that story into a series of programs with traction and with impact? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that question. The, the first thing I want to say, you know, in, in, in your contextualizing of the question, you know, veterans, um, you know, I, I really uh, want folks to understand that veterans are an asset to any organization. Um, you know, I, I think there's been a narrative over the last 20 years uh, where our, our world, uh, our country has been in a conflict in the world um, around post-traumatic stress and disability and whatnot. Um, and that is something that we should be talking about. Um, but the realities are, you know, 20% of military veterans have post-traumatic stress. Uh, and, um, and in fact, like 11% of the American population has post-traumatic stress. So, um, you know, that's something that is not just unique to the military. But it's also uh, but, overcoming stress gives you a superpower. It, it, exactly, exactly. And, that, and to that point, you know, military veterans are an asset because they um, they are taught and, they're, and required, quite frankly, to think in an interdisciplinary way. And so when they're trying to solve a problem, they understand intuitively through experience that um, you have to solve the problem. And if you run into an obstacle and then an obstacle and then an obstacle, you still have to solve the problem. And so, you know, there can be a, a creativity amongst veterans and a tenacity um, that is, is learned and, and built in. But, you know, you asked about uh, past legacy. You know, we, 
we as a foundation, we exist because of Marie Tillman, and now Marie Tillman Shenton, uh, and Pat's widow, uh, and other friends and family, Alex Garwood, Ben Hill, Chris Hart, uh, and others um, who started this foundation uh, wanting to support uh, veterans and military spouses and their education. And the whole premise of this work is rooted in optimism, rooted in the idea that veterans and military spouses can do more in the future than whatever they've done in the past. And that's what we select for. And we could get in our selection process later, but the four values that we're based on are service, scholarship, humble leadership, and impact. And those come straight from Pat. Those, those are, those are, that's how he lived his life. And there are plenty of stories uh, about him being exceptionally intellectually curious. He, he was known to start debates with people and take, take a position that he didn't even agree with just to, just to probe um, kind of the boundaries of his own thought um, by understanding somebody else. And uh, he was somebody who was always curious and always willing to kind of push back a little bit, but at his core, uh, and I think this is evidenced by the decisions that he made, he had a very strong set of core principles. And when it came time for him to serve, he chose to serve rather than take a multi-million dollar con continued contract with the NFL. And we try to, we try to look for those four different uh, values in our scholars that we select. And, and so far, you know, our, our scholar community is doing great things in the world. And understanding difference and appreciating difference, probing difference, sharing the, uh, what is, uh, what we all have in common and, and our common objectives, but also understanding that different members of a team will bring in different attributes to bear in order to solve that problem is part and parcel of what you're doing. So you're not, when you're looking for your scholars, you're looking for attributes, but you're not looking for hom homogeneity, right? A hundred percent. You know, the military is, um, you know, people of all stripes and colors and experiences are drawn to service, uh, uniform service in the military. And as a result, those who have led in, in a military environment, um, whether particularly challenging or not, uh, they have had to work with a diverse team. And so the folks that are coming out, um, you know, they understand that, great, you know, you might come from Arkansas and you might come from Seattle or wherever, um, you know, vastly different, you know, life experiences growing up and, and family experiences and whatever, socioeconomic and other things. Um, but uh, when you're working together and the job in front of you is to do this thing, it doesn't matter. It matters only that each person is committed to the mission and committed to each other. And so, that like that that loyalty um, that uh, to the mission and to each other is super strong in veterans, and you know that's that's something that organizations I think are learning over the last ten to fifteen years. That if you can tap into that, and this applies really to any employee, I would say, but if you could tap into the reason why they care about your mission, uh, if you tap into that reason and make sure to touch it and nurture it and make sure that they understand their, their role and how it contributes to that mission, um, that's what builds that loyalty. And you know, veterans come in just primed, ready to, to think that way anyway. So talk about how those values um, end up um, translating into practical programs. Could you describe the range of programs that you offer, please? Sure. Um, we kind of the three big buckets of ways that we support, we unite and empower military veterans and military spouses. The three different ways we offer a scholarship. So it's a very right. practical, there's a selection process. We select the top 3% of applicants, um, 60 a year. There's a scholarship. There is a community. We put a lot of effort into making sure that our scholars know each other and have built relationships with each other that when they are in a, in a point of struggle or a point of opportunity, either professionally or personally, they go to each other to solve that problem or, or capture that opportunity. So scholarship, uh, community, and leadership development. The average age of- And there's competition as well. There's competition for the scholarship. So you have a filtering process that allows people to not only compete, but also when they are selected, they're selected uh, with with a future view from your foundation as to what their potential might be, and they're connected back into the foundation and back to each other to provide a mutually supportive network to as as they progress in their career. Correct. That, that's absolutely right. Well, that and that's the value of the community piece, right? Um, you know, we've we've been we our, our first class of Tillman scholars in its current iteration was 2009. Those folks who were selected in 2009, 10, I was I was in the class of 2011. Um, we're getting you know further into our career. We could start hiring other Tillman scholars, and in fact, 
on our team at the foundation, our new director of programs, uh, educational doctorate, former uh, you know um, leader at FedEx Freight, um, formerly before that was a high school principal. She's a 2014 Tillman Scholar, uh, is now on our team, right? So we're we're in a, we're in a place. We've got other scholars on the team too. We're in a place where scholars are helping and exponentially helping the community grow, and so that's the importance of that community. If if we didn't do the work over the last 10 years to keep a 2013 Tillman Scholar connected to the community, then the 2023 class doesn't benefit from, from that person's um, kind of growth and whatnot. The last thing that we offer is leadership development. You know, the average age of a Tillman Scholar when we select them is 28. And yes, that's pretty junior in your career. You know, you've had some experiences, you've kind of seen where you want to go. Um, the range is, is pretty high. We'll get folks who are 22, 23 years old and folks that are you know, 50 years old applying to be a Tillman Scholar, depending on where they're at in their academic journey. Um, but uh, there's a lot of growth to happen, you know, in a community with the average age of 28 when you're selected, a lot of leadership growth. And so we want to be a part of that for the next 20 years. And so we built out programming uh, to support that. One of the things we, we built out recently and launched earlier this year, after three years of development, was the Tillman Leadership Institute. And the Tillman Leadership Institute is a leadership curriculum. We partnered with McKinsey and some others uh, to build this out, uh, built off of our four values, where Tillman scholars are sharing their experiences and what they've learned about leadership uh, and how it's been applied both in the military, but even more importantly, outside of the military. We're not, we're not here to espouse uh, a military version of leadership, but instead to talk about what's been learned and what applies in a non-military environment. And so far, um, the, or the partners, the universities, the corporations, the nonprofits that have that have been partnered in that um, have told us that it's, it's been valuable for their teams. One of the things that we find in uh, helping uh, people who to transition their careers from, yeah. uh, from the services into civilian context is that there is a uh, disconnect um, in in a number of different areas, the military is a very very large organization. It's very structured. Um, it has a particular culture. So one of the challenges is transitioning into smaller entities, and and everything is smaller than the U.S. military, right? Even the massive corporations are smaller than the U.S. military, and also there is a sometimes a language disconnect, right? The military has its own language. It has its own terminology. Uh, it has its own, um, well, acronyms, right? And so there's also this, this other thing where when we're working with hiring authorities, we're trying to create a, a bridge between, one, the cultural aspects, and two, the linguistic aspects. Very, very simple, fundamental stuff that can actually serve as a filtering barrier that unfairly disadvantages people come from one environment transitioning to another. How do you deal with these types of, of issues? Yeah, you know, there's, you're right. There's a, there's a language issue. There's an expectation uh, of issue around working in a large organization, a small organization. I'll say this about, there's kind of two points there. The military is a large organization. Yes. Um, what does that practically mean? It means that, you know, if you have an HR issue, like there's a whole, you know, there's a lot of resources behind that. There's a go reference the policy. Okay. Um, you know, the practical things of work. Um, but, you know, the military is diverse, right? So some people are drawn to that. Some people find security and safety in working in large organizations. And some people find that, um, you know, kind of uh, stifling uh, and, and don't enjoy it. And so, um, you know, the military community is not one just because they were in a large organization means that's what they loved. And so um, you could find people when they're transitioning out, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, or at least signal in some way, I really appreciated, you know, the bigness of it or the stability of it. And that, I want that again, or they'll tell you, Hey, like I got out because I wanted to be able to have a little bit more autonomy. Um, right. And, and, you know, that's what I'm looking for next. And so, you know, just knowing the person makes the difference there, you know, on the language piece, you know, I, I'd, I'd say in two directions, um, veterans have a responsibility to overcome that themselves as well, um, to understand like, hey, you're in a different environment now. Um, you know, there are things that you don't want to say the same way. Uh, and if you're going to transition, you know, it's up to you to talk to your fellow veterans who are a couple years ahead of you and figure that out. Uh, on, the, on the employer side or coworker side, I think there's, you know, as we all offer each other grace in whatever, whatever situation people are going through, you know, let people grow into a new environment. I think there's, there's a, you know, some forgiveness that can be offered on the other side as well. 
Well, I think the this whole approach of, of cultivating community and uh, not thinking that it's done with the scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. Not thinking it's done with the reward, um, not thinking it's it, it's it's uh, that that all of the solution is within your organization, right? Those kinds of approaches are so important. Also, engaging families because this is a whole family uh, issue. How do you help? Um, someone who is transitioning, who is a member of one family, become a member of a different family. Um, as, as they uh, leave the military, how do you create this sense of belonging, which is so strong in, in uh, a lot of military contexts, um, in, a, in a civilian context? Do you find yeah. that there is an, an aspect to what you're doing that is um, almost of... of um, in the community building, it's it's dealing. Is do you deal with the soft aspects of of that transition as well as the operating aspects and, and the practical aspects of of you know, scholarship and so on? Yeah, you know the 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 practical side of scholarship. We we want to be a support while our scholars are going through their educational journey, and um, whether they're getting a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a law, medical, you name it. Um, we want to be a support in that front and. A lot of the the like more tactical things you're referencing right now um, are uh, you know um, are handled by the school, right? The schools that that are that our scholars are at. And so you know if you're you know I, I you know I was a Tillman scholar in a two year uh, graduate program, master's degree. Where, and where it did was, you go? Uh, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School. Okay, so you were to the Harvard Kennedy School now. Did did the school basically help you um, in in other aspects that that were important that were connected to the Tillman Foundation as well? Um, uh, uh, probably not in ways that were connected to the Tillman Foundation. Okay. So I, I you know and I was in the third class, and so our the foundation's relationships with all the universities were um, a little bit nascent at that time, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, uh, the school certainly helped me to understand, um, tell me, figure out what was possible for the next step of my career. Um, you know, a lot of the thing with military veterans is they come out and they don't know what's possible. Um, they, they'll ask questions like, oh, a nonprofit, like, do you get paid? Uh, you know, and they just don't understand that th there's this whole world out there of, of non in this industry of nonprofits. And, you know, they're not all the same. You know, people talk about the nonprofit industry as if, it, oh, the nonprofit industry is this. I've had people ask me like, oh, should I work in the nonprofit industry? Which is like equivalent in my mind to like, should I work for a business? Like, well, right. maybe, you know, but like, let's, t let's have a little bit more of a defined conversation. So, um, you know, a lot of veterans come out and they just don't know what they don't know. And, and what school did for me is it helped, helped me to understand and just gain some awareness for what was out there that wasn't necessarily connected with the foundation at the time, but the foundation gave me in a time when, you know, uh, you know, one of the, one of the unique things about um, leaving the military is it's not only a job, it's an identity. You literally wear a uniform. That's what you do. Right. right? And people, you know, call you sir and salute you when they see you around all this sort of stuff. Um, if you're on the officer side uh, and uh, from an identity perspective, what the foundation helped me to do is find my people. Uh, you know, the Tillman scholars are people who are really ambitious um, to solve a problem. They're not ambitious um, to the point where they need a title or they're trying to step on you to get to their thing. They're ambitious because they want to solve a problem. And the foundation, certainly prior to me, I think has done a good job at collecting a group of individuals who are passionate about solving a problem. And that's where their ambition lies. I think that is such an important point. And, so, and thank you so much for, for making it. This idea of finding your identity. I, you know, sometimes, you know, although I'm, I'm so very familiar with these kinds of issues, sometimes even I forget that, you know, when you're transitioning out of the military, you're also transitioning from an identity. Mm -hmm. And there is a loss of identity and you kind of have to reestablish it, you know, in the, ne in the next years, right? Yep. You, you no longer get saluted. You no longer are within that familiar context of, of knowing what you're doing the next day, right? And then- yep. Um, it could be a little uh, discombobulating. So uh, thank you so much for for um, for reminding me of this. Now, when you when you got out and you went through the program, yeah, you didn't know you were going to end up running the Pat Tillman Foundation. I had no idea. 
Could you just, as we wrap up, could you just give us a sense from from your own personal experience, your trajectory, and how sure. you ended up uh, at the Pat Tillman Foundation? Sure. Um, to 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 describe this, I, I've got to give you a, a conceptual framework that's guided my career choices in the past. So, um, and I, I in conversation in grad school, I. I came up with this and it's been helpful for me. So imagine a tic-tac-toe board, right? Three by three. And on the columns are public sector, private sector, uh, nonprofit sector, or I'm sorry, uh, government. Uh, sorry, public is government, private sector, nonprofit. Okay, so right. three different sectors. And then the, the rows are functions, people, processes, and budgets, right? Okay. So now you have nine boxes. And the way that I've approached my career and, and this comes from knowing myself, right? I'm somebody who's not going to be um, a specialist, uh, a technical specialist on a thing. Uh, I'm somebody who's more drawn to be a generalist. Uh, and I, I enjoy bouncing from one topic to the next topic. It's very different. Uh, that, that, that sparks me. And so this framework is built for that. Um, so I've, I've basically tried to fill in all nine boxes with different roles and experiences that I've had professionally. And so, you know, I was elected to the local school board uh, outside of Boston for six years uh, in a public setting, municipal setting. I oversaw, you know, a $70 million uh, uh, budget in that capacity as I led their finance committee um, and worked with the superintendent and her, her team to, to build the, the that budget and, and administer it. Um, you know, I, in the military, I had a variety of different roles um, where I uh, um, managed other people. Um, in, uh, um, I've also held uh, uh, technology startup roles that have been in the private sector where I've been stretched a little bit in a business development sense or product management sense uh, in a world that, you know, I had to do a lot of learning. And so over, you know, 15 years, I've, I've filled in these nine different boxes. And the, the premise here is I could keep doing that from a career perspective to a point where I'm still valuable at every stage of my career to the next organization I might work for. Um, I'm still valuable. I've built a skill set that is progressively, um, you know, more valuable. Um, but also, uh, I, I've built a skill set that maintains the most amount of optionality going forward. So at every at every transition point, I could say, well, do I, you know, maybe would I like to work in the government? Would I like to work in the private sector or, or a nonprofit? Um, and ideally, the way that I just operate, like, oh, I like having those options. Um, and you know, so what that's done for me after five years in the army, two years in school, then I've, you know, I had a, a period, you know, you might call it like a sampling period where I went from nonprofit to a tech startup to a nonprofit to a tech startup and now here at the Pat Tillman Foundation. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's served me well because it, I, I've been able to pull um, solutions from one domain into the next domain. And, and I think that's, that's been, I think it's benefited me. It's a great, great story, Dan. Thank you so much for sharing it. I mean, what you're what you're doing is you're you're describing the journey of so many of your Tillman scholars, right? Mm -hmm. You're describing the the journey of so many people who are not Tillman scholars who are exiting the military. How you can actually manage these various transitions, how you can explore, how you can look at options, how you can take skills and at an abstract level apply them into a different circumstance. Thank you so much for your service in the military. Thank you so much for your for serving on a school board, which I guess in 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 today's environment it might be even more hazardous. And thank you so much for sharing the work of the Pat Tillman Foundation, Dan Futrell, uh, CEO. Please thank your boards, thank your donors, thank your people, and thank your your Pat Tillman scholars for uh, helping us uh, in this society become a stronger United States. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark, for sharing our story. And, you know, for those who are watching, um, I hope you get a chance to meet Tillman Scholars. Uh, it's a, a wonderful community um, that Marie Tillman Shenton has built. Uh, and um, I'm grateful to be a part of it. To meet and to employ Tillman Scholars, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Have a great day, Dan. Thank you.